Welcome to day two of the 2024 Widening the Pipeline Fellowship with the National Press Foundation. Before we get started, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our funders, the Evelyn Y. Davis Foundation and Lenovo. For this first session of the morning, it is rare to have the opportunity to interact with a person who literally is the reason that we all are in this room today. I say that to say that Bobby Bowman was one of a group of journalists called the Metro Seven at the Washington Post. And in the early 70s, Bobby and her colleagues sued the paper because of hiring practices and barriers that kept them from attaining some of the newsroom jobs that other journalists were able to have, simply because of the color of their skin. I was just telling Bobby that through the years, uh, even though I had an a internship at the Washington Post in 1984, I did not get a chance to meet her then. But her name was one of the names that I heard so often and so frequently at every corner of my own journalism journey, not only due to her work at the Post, but w also with the American Society of Newspaper Editors, a long and, and storied tenure there. And then more recently, her work into exploring her own family's history and background and, and uh, just staying active and, and positive and busy throughout her entire life. So I felt it was important to start us off on our official formal program to hear from someone who not only has insights into what it has taken to get all of us to where we are right now, but she's going to be bringing us a presentation that helps us understand the significance of building our expertise and staying in the game in the years to come. So it is my privilege and my honor to present to you Bobby Bowman. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Southern, so we always start off with a good morning. And thank you, Rachel, for that gracious, gracious introduction. It is just wonderful to see all of you all here. I've been telling Rachel how much I appreciate this invitation. Um, I'm going to start on a personal note. I and many of my friends spent much of our careers fighting to diversify our newsrooms because diversity means accuracy, and accuracy is job one for journalists. So look at you all. You are the realization of our work, our hopes, and our dreams, and I just thank you so much for being here. Now, let's get started. We're going to start back 100 years ago. A hundred years ago, the results of the 1920 census hit this country like an earthquake. Why? Because it showed for the first time the majority of people in the United States now lived in cities and not on farms. This was a massive shift in people and most importantly, a massive shift in power. Now, a hundred years later, we got the results of the 2020 census, and those results also hit this country like an earthquake. Why? Because it showed for the first time the only population growth was among minorities, folks who look like all of us in this room. And even more importantly, for the first time, the absolute number of white people had actually decreased in this country. That had never happened before, that we saw an absolute decrease in white people. We now stand on the brink of the next America. No country has ever undergone the historic demographic change this country will go through for the next 20 to 30 years. You all are already covering this story, whether you realize it or not. And this is going to be the story that you're going to really cover the rest of your lives. You will cover a country and cities and communities that are no longer defined by one race. White people are now the minority 
in, two, in our two largest states, California and Texas, and other states are going to follow. When the population changes, everything else changes. The food you see in your grocery store, the restaurants you find in your neighborhood, the children you see at your schools, the labor force in this country is changing from white to brown. Changing population is about who has power. The power structure, so when the demograph, when the population changes, who runs City Hall changes, who runs the Congress changes, and who controls who the president is changes. If you remember only one thing from this session, I hope you remember Bobby said changing population is not about numbers. It is about power, and you're going to hear power a lot through this. Now, let me tell you what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about how this incredibly historic change is happening and how you're going to need to cover it. So let's start with the basics. For that, we'll go to the PowerPoint. Why do we take a census in this country every 10 years? Don't want everybody speak at once. That's exactly right. Um, that's, a, that's a good beginning for us. But what is the other reason we take a census in this country? I'm sorry? All, we, all of that's true, but there's a very basic reason. Th that we certainly need that. Because it's in the Constitution. It is in the Constitution that we have to take a census every year. Why would the Founding Fathers think this is so important that we needed to write it in the Constitution in Article I, Section 2? I know all of you all went to history classes. Thank yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. For, Taylor? Yes. Taylor. That's very good, Taylor. So tell us more about that. Um, at least the House of Representatives, representatives are based on the number of uh, the population of each state. Um, so if a state uh, has a so if a state increases in population, then they get more representatives and votes in the House. If they decrease, then they get um, some votes taken away. And I believe that happened with the last census. That's exactly right. Kayla's on it. The reason they put this in the Constitution, as I said, this is all about power. Remember the country and the Constitution was based on two great compromises, right? Remember when they gathered for the Constitutional Convention, the little states were really afraid that the big states were going to end up overwhelming them. So when they set up Congress, we have two parts of Congress, right? The Senate and the House. So how many, how many senators does each state get? Two. Perfect. So whether you are Rhode Island or Texas, you get two senators. But how many representatives do you get in the House? <laughs> Depends on the number of people you have, right? The more people you have, the more representatives you have, the more power you have. The South realized this instantly. So this is the first compromise. So as soon as they decided the House was going to be based on population, and you know, to find out how many people, you got to go count them. That is a US census. The South said, we want you to count our slaves. And the North said, you're crazy. You treat these people like farm animals. The South said, that may be true, but for the purpose of us getting more power, we want you to count our slaves. So how were the slaves counted? That's right. This is where we get three-fifths of a man. Okay? And those are the two great compromises that then set up Congress. Um, now, now that we know the basics, this is why we do, that's why we've done a U.S. Census in this country for every year since 1790. And that census has changed. You know, I, I encourage everybody to go to the census website or just Google history of census forms. You would, you are shocked. You can be shocked at how the census forms have changed. All right, now let's do some basic demographic work here. Um, you know, just to make sure we're sort of grounded in where we should be. How many people actually live in this country? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I need to hear a number. That is very close. Um, 
it's about 330, 335. For our purposes, we're going to use 335 million people. The United States has the third largest country in population. India is now first, China is second, and the United States is third. Now, what percentage of those nice folks are white? Yes? 70 is close, 75 percent. In America. Sorry, 75 percent in America, right? Yes. Okay. What percent are um, Hispanic? Twenty. Twenty percent are Hispanic. What percent are black? Twelve is great. Twelve is fine. And what percent are Asian? Six. Okay. Now, what do you notice about these numbers? Just the percentages. Oh, you know, y'all have made my morning. It is wonderful when I'm talking to a group of journalists who are not afraid of third grade arithmetic. <laughs> that is exactly right. I will tell you, as a, as a former editor, whenever anybody gives you a list of percentages, the first thing you should do is to add up the numbers. You will be surprised at the amount of times they do not add up to 100. And that may be the beginning of your story, frankly. These numbers are right, but they do not they add up to more than 100%. Why is that? There is a double count in here. They identify as multiple uh, races. Yeah, but we don't have them here. That's, that's a whole separate category. Other, other two or more races. Um, and you need to look at those numbers. Yes, that's true. But Arabs are not on this list. They're already baked into this number. Where's the double count in this list? Muchísimas gracias. Tienes razón. That is that is exactly the problem. For, it's Fernanda. Which is because that is exactly right. White is a race, black is a race, Asian is a race, Hispanic is an ethnic group. And just as Fernando was saying, and I can show you this on the census form, on the census form you get to check whether you are Hispanic or not, and then you check your race. A majority of Hispanics in this country will check white. Therefore, many of these people are up here. So the number we need to get this to add up to 100 is a, word, is a phrase we've all heard, white, not Hispanic, as I call them, ordinary white folks, OK? <laughs> OK, and that number is 49%. So I'm just going to put NH for not Hispanic, but still white. This is 59%. You'll notice. This white column includes Hispanics, it includes Arabs. So when you take out the, the people out of this number who are what we call ordinary white folks, it goes down to 59%. So the country is going to become more diverse. This white number is actually going to grow. But it's going to grow largely beca because of Hispanics. This is going to be the number of what we consider, I consider ordinary white folks. Now, the other important number that you need here, and I've sort of run out of space. OK, so this is, I'm just going to say ordinary white people right now. <laughs> OK, so the number of ordinary white folks we now have is 59%. If you looked at ordinary white people who are 18 years and younger, what would that percentage be? Anybody have a guess? 
This is under 18 and white. 47%. You notice that is below 50%. This is the explanation point as to where this country is heading. Ordinary white people, as you know, it, the, the younger you go, the more diverse the country gets. Now, let's take a closer look. Now that we've got the basics down, let's take a closer look at the census, what the census actually found. Now, this is the census number going all the way back to 1790 when we started the census. And you notice this is just white population. You know, the white population has been going along. Look what happens when you get to 1960. After 1960, the ordinary white population in this country starts to go down until we get to 2020, when it's just what I said in the introduction, the actual number of white people actually decreased. I mean, this is an astonishing that, com that comes from our friends at um, Brookings. Now, let's look at, so if white people are actually decreasing, why did we have population growth at all? Because of Latinos, thank you so much. In the last 10 years, Latinos have grown by 11 million people. And this is the two or more, who mentioned two or more races? This was the other surprise in the census. We've never had so many people declare themselves to be mixed race people. Now, the census has always asked about mixed race people. If you look at the 1890 census, in fact, I can look, I can tell my, I'm doing my family genealogy, and when I get back to about 1870, we're called mulattoes, right? <laughs> then we go to colored, and then we go to Negro, and we finally get to black. <laughs> but those are how the census, you know, sort of words for describing mixed race people have gone. In the 1890 census, this country actually asked people, how many of you are mixed race? And they use words like mulatto, words we don't even use in polite company anymore, like quadroon, octoroon. And what those words mean is a quadroon has, is quarter black, octoroon is, you know, is eight, per, eight black, you know. These words we don't even use. But we have asked about mixed race people before this. Nothing new about ask about mixed race people. You notice Asian grew by five million, blacks by two million. Look at the white number. This is a white, not Hispanic number. Had declined by five million people. This, again, just explains why our country is more diverse, um, which is very, very historic. Now, what caused this incredible change in 1920 and in the 2020 census? One word describes both of that is immigration. Immigration has literally changed the face of this country. Every 60 to 80 years, we have an ugly immigration fight in this country. It started in the 1840s when the Irish came. And everybody, you know, there were signs that said, no Irish and dogs allowed. Then we had another one. But every 60 to 80 years, we have an immigration fight in this country. And we're in the middle of another one of our very ugly immigration fights. Every time we fight over immigration in this country, we're fighting about race. So I thought it would be helpful this morning if we just took a very short trip through American immigration history because it is literally the thing that has changed the face of our country. And we're going to do it with this chart, okay? This chart shows the percentage of people who have been born someplace else literally for the last 100 years. And you will notice that immigration is the bookends of 20th century America. We started with large numbers of immigrants. We ended the century with large number of immigrants. Now we're going to start back in 1882. When we start, you know, usually anybody can get on. You, if you can pay for a boat ticket, you can come to this country. But we stopped one group of people from doing that in 1882. Who were the, who were the first people we excluded from this country? Chinese. Chinese, thank you so much. We asked the Chinese to come over 
and build our railroads. After that, we were ready to send them back to China. And basically, that's what we did. We passed a law that said, if you are Chinese, you cannot come here. And not only that, if you were here, you couldn't become a citizen. So that meant first generation Chinese could not become citizens. Now, remember what happened right after the Civil War? This country went into its Industrial Revolution, right? The Industrial Revolution began in the North. We needed working people to make steel in Pittsburgh and in Cleveland and in Gary, Indiana, to make cars in Detroit and to make clothes in Utica, New York. So millions of poor, uneducated Poles, Jews, Slovaks, Greeks, Italians, all came to do the hardest, dirtiest jobs in this country. These were Southern and Eastern Europeans. Um, and come they did. That's why in 1910, 15% of the people who lived in this country had actually come from someplace else. This is the largest number we have ever seen. It's also, this was a time, 1910 was a time of strict segregation when there were rising anti-immigrant feelings just like we have now. The Ku Klux Klan, you know, the Ku Klux Klan started after the Civil War. The Union Army actually destroyed the Ku Klux Klan after the Civil War. But the Ku Klux Klan resurrected itself in 1915-1916, not in the South. <laughs> the headquarters of the Ku Klux Klan was in Indiana. I mean, that sort of tells you everything you need to know. And they weren't particularly after black people. I mean, they were still lynching black people in the South, right? But the new Ku Klux Klan were, started lynching Jews and Italians. Those are the people that they went off after. The Ku Klux Klan marched through North Denver in 1926. There are no black people living in North Denver in 1926. The Klan was marching against the Italians because that, there was terrible discrimination against Italians and against Jews. And because of that, particularly once people saw these numbers from 1910, you know, the, 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 the work started to get a new immigration law in this country. And we finally did that in 1924. Yes, exactly 100 years from this year, we passed the cruelest immigration law we have ever passed. And it was directly aimed at stopping Eastern and Southern Europeans from coming, the Italians, the Poles, the Jews, and the Greeks. And of course, it totally excluded um, Asians. Again, that wasn't even a thought. And again, this law says Asians cannot become citizens. And this law created the Border Patrol for the first time. This law is so notorious because it blocked Jews from escaping Nazi Germany during the 1930s. This is the main reason why Jews could not get into this country, that plus the virulent anti-Semitism that was out there. Now, the law was passed to preserve the racial composition of this country. This country always thinks it is white, Anglo-Saxon, and Protestant. Therefore, they don't want Catholics, and they don't want Jews. And this law worked. This law worked beautifully. You can see from the numbers, right? After 1920, the immigration numbers start to go down. The law worked very, very well. Well, when John F. Kennedy, the grandson of Irish immigrants, ran for president in 1960, one of the things JFK promised to do was to change this really ruthless immigration law. Now, as we know, Kennedy was killed in 1963. So Lyndon Johnson, who became president, you know, picked up. They had already started rewriting the immigration law. But the man who was mainly responsible for the 1965 immigration law was a man by the name of Emanuel Seller, grandson of German-Jewish immigrants who had come to the country in about 1880 and the 1890s. Um, they actually got this law passed. And the new law replaced the old quota system, which is what the 1924 law had set up. And under the new law, 20,000 people could come from every country around the world. They leveled the playing field. So whether you lived in 
what was called well, Belarus was part of Russia at that time. Whether you lived in Thailand or whether you lived in Germany, the same number of people could immigrate, and that was 20,000. And the new system also gave priority to people who already had family members here, because Manny Seller, you know, from Brooklyn, congressman from Brooklyn, where there were lots of Jewish people who had been trying to get their family members in during the war. So Manny Seller thought, you know, we'll do family reunification because that will make it easier for, for Eastern Europeans to come. But in 1965, Europe had been rebuilt after the war. You know, people in Europe were really pretty happy at that point, and they weren't going to come to this country. But there were other people who wanted to come to this country. They would be the Koreans. They would be the Indians. They would be the Chinese. The second thing that happened, this bill said, family reunification was first, but people with skills. We don't want any more poor, ignorant immigrants here. We want people who come with skills, people who come with advanced degrees, people who want to be engineers, let's say. And some of your parents, frankly, may have come to, they may have come as students, they met each other here, and they stayed. Um, and for the first time under the 1965 law, there was a numerical um, number for the number of Central and South Americans who could come to this country. Our southern border has always been as porous as Swiss cheese, frankly. People could come and go and cross the border. People didn't care because the border was so porous because there was a large agricultural industry in California, in Arizona, in New Mexico, and in Texas. And all of those farmers needed farm laborers who all came from Mexico, by and large. So they weren't very happy to have people sort of come and go across the border. During World War II, we begged Mexicans to come to this country under something called the Bracero Program. So American boys, you know, were in Europe and in the Pacific fighting. American boys had left the farm, you know, put on a uniform and gone out to basically save this world. And we needed people, you know, to still tend our farms. We asked Mexicans to come, and they did, and they came under what is called the Brazero Program. Now, the program was supposed to be for the war. This program did not end until 1954 because the farmers in those border states did not want to give up this great supply of labor. So, Lyndon Johnson signed this law at the foot of the Statue of Liberty in the fall of 1965. The pictures from this are really beautiful. It is that law that literally changed the face of this country and probably is the reason that some of you all are sitting in this room. So, a hundred years ago, the Poles, the Jews, the Italians came. After this law was passed, it was the Koreans, the Salvadorians, the Guatemalans, the Indians who came. It is the diversity of this immigration that has gradually changed the racial makeup of this country. So now that you know where we came from, why this country is changing, why you all are sitting in this room, now that you understand that history and that context, let's talk about how you're going to cover this story. Now, as we said, when the population changes, everything else changes, including who has power. This is an election year, you might have noticed. So let's look at how the change in population has changed who votes in this country, because voting is where the power is. So just take a look at this chart. Um, as the country becomes more diverse, the voters are going to become more diverse. In all 50 states, the share of ordinary white voters has declined over the past 20 years. And 10 states have actually experienced a double-digit drop in the share of white voters. 
And this is all according to the Pew Research Center. If you are not familiar with their work, I suggest you Google them. They do excellent work on demographic change. During that same period, Hispanic voters have come to make up an increasingly larger share of the voters in every state. And you can see from this chart, I hope you're impressed because it took me a while to put this together, I want you to know. <laughs> so these are, the, these are the ordinary white folks. So in 2000, they were 30, they were 76 percent of the voters in this country. You notice 20 years later, they're down to 71 percent. That number is going to continue to go down. Look at Latinos. Latinos have almost doubled. And remember, in order to vote in this country, what, do you, what are the two requirements to vote in this country? Thank you. What's your name? Michael, thank you. Oh, yeah, Michael and I were standing outside together. <laughs> That's exactly right. You have to be 18, and you have to be a citizen of these here United States. We know many Latinos in this country are younger than that. And so many of them are young. So to even with that, to be able to nearly double the number of voters in 20 years is really pretty amazing. The black vote has stayed the same, and the Asian vote is going to start to grow also. And then these are just others. Um, so the gains for Hispanics are particularly large in southwestern United States. No surprise, right? This was formerly Mexican, Mexico and American. In fact, <laughs> some of your Mexican-American friends will tell you, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. And they are absolutely right. So states like Nevada, California, and Texas have seen a rapid growth in the Hispanic share of the voters over the last 20 years, according to Pew. So in summary, you will need to tell your viewers, your readers, your listeners, the implication for them for their pocketbooks, their communities, and their children as this historic population change occurs because people are afraid of change. That's what this is all about. People are afraid of change, particularly when it threatens their power. That's what we journalists do. We explain to people how the world around them is changing and why. Good luck covering this story. I am so envious that you all get to cover this incredibly historic story. Thank you so much, and I am happy to take questions. I'll start, I guess. Um, I'm going to sit down. Because when I entered a newsroom in 1986 for my first full-time job, it was the St. Petersburg Times, oh, yeah. and I was out in the Clearwater office. And they had never really had a journalist who covered North Clearwater, which was the black community of Clearwater. And I was probably one, if not the, I may have been the first black journalist in that bureau, but I, certainly. That doesn't surprise me. Yeah. <laughs> so when I look around my, the, the media landscape now and see all of the jobs that are audience engagement. And I think we talked about this. What's happening now in media is they're looking around and they're saying, oops, we didn't take all of this demographic change into consideration and now we're, we're in trouble. Talk more about what's happening in terms of the media having its own internal reckoning about the way these communities have been covered. I have been doing this lecture for about 20 years, and I started at ASME. Because when I came to, this is the American Society of Newspaper Editors that now goes under another name. I've always loved demographics. And when I started looking at the 2020 census, and we knew it, the Census Bureau has been saying since the 1990s, this country is going to change. This is what we call an ooze story. You know, there, there's breaking news, and then there's the ooze story. The ooh stories are the things that actually change the country and change the world. Uh, so we've known since the 1990s this is going to happen. So when I came to ASME in about 2000, and I saw, and I was the diversity director, I think, I think they now call my job DEI or something. <laughs> um, I said, this, I said, nobody wants to hear about diversity. I never talked about diversity. 
because you know people I get bored when I hear that word right I said if I'm going to appeal to editors and reporters you have to talk about story this is the best story going and I started and I started doing this to say to people say to editors reporters that our, the seminars that we gave were for edit were for editors this is your new audience <laughs> these are your new readers because at that point we were only talking to newspapers we tried to tell them and, and when I would go to different places I would tailor the demographics to tell them to show them how their communities were changing but you know as we like to say journalists cover change but they hate to do it themselves that's what we're talking about <laughs> that's exactly what happened people you know this goes back to the internet that was this time the internet was starting people say oh you know nobody's going to use the internet yeah, we thought of it was a big fad. Yeah, it was a big fad. <laughs> Any other questions? Any questions? No. Um, I'm I'm Sarah. Um, I cover energy and the environment in West Virginia. But um, that's right. You're seeing the story, <laughs> or you will. <laughs> De it's, West Virginia is depopulating. <laughs> yeah, one of the many issues. Um, I will admit that I did when in a meeting. I did say, please explain to me why people should move to the state because. We were having a legislature conversation. But anyways, um, so that went over really well. Um, <laughs> but um, I have a quick technical question first, and then I, I want to follow up um, to Rachel's question. Um, for ordinary white folk, for the seven, for the 2020 number, are we including um, Arab and Middle Eastern? Yes. OK. Yeah. You go ahead, and then I want to come back to that question. That's a very important question. Um, sorry, it's my pet peeve. That, well, that's one of my pet peeves. But anyways. <laughs> Moving a, a, a over from that, you said, and you kind of touched upon it, you know, people are afraid of change. And, it's, and you know, we're covering change, and sometimes the newsrooms, you know, aren't really susceptible to that. And well, it's still that way, is it? <laughs> um, you know, how do you navigate that? Like, we can all sit here and talk about this and look at this and be like, this is something that we really need to focus on and, and start moving our coverage to, but the people in leadership positions are those very people that are afraid of change and don't see it the way that we see it. Um, so how do you kind of navigate that? How do you push? This story is happening in your community. This is our covering the news. You know, these people are moving in or moving out in your case. And these are new people coming in. Um, I used to work in Detroit. And when I was in Detroit, the Arab community was already starting to grow. And we covered them because, you know, they had they were moving into Dearborn. Um, Dearborn is the headquarters of Ford Motor Company. It's located to the, to the western part side of Detroit. I'm keeping an eye on the time here. Um, just to give you a little background about Detroit, and then I'll get on with the story. When I moved to Detroit in 1986, the first thing people told me is, Bobby, don't go to Detroit. You can get killed over there because it is like the south. Dearborn literally would not let black people move in. Arabs have always been in Detroit. I mean, Arabs started coming to Detroit as soon as they started making cars in Detroit. And many of them moved to Dearborn. So they got to a critical mass, they were in the schools, and they started having problems in the school. We had to cover that. You know, these people are going to move into your communities, they're going to start having problems, they're going to start going to church. You cover the people who live in your communities, right? So. You know, the police department is going to start hiring people who speak Arabic or Spanish. Um, you know, the, the schools are the first people who have to deal with this. Um, you know, so you're going to need more. All of that's a news story. So what's the problem? <laughs> it's news. A changes in your community are news. I think I sort of uh, understand a little bit of the context of where you're coming from because you're absolutely right. It's news, it's happening, deal with it. But when the gatekeepers are still in a certain mindset, and I've always said through the years that what was ironic for me is that people who were running the Chicago Tribune or the Columbus whatever were all largely white males. Mm -hmm none of whom lived in those inner cities or in those cities themselves. They all live out in the suburbs or whatever. So I think we still have, have a ways to go in terms of the gatekeepers truly being on board, or am I? Well, okay. 
But this, this story is happening in the suburbs. I mean, I live in Fairfax County, which is one of the richest counties in this country. The largest minority group in Fairfax County is now Asian, thank you so much. You know, this used to be a county where slavery was. <laughs> Fairfax County used to be black and white. Now I'm the number three minority in, in Fairfax County. Asian to first, Latinos are second. This is a suburb, the old immigrants, the Jews, the Greeks, they move to cities. The new immigrants are moving to the, and this is a small town story. Um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name. Nisha? I'm sorry? Nisha. Nisha. Nisha, why don't you tell us what's going on in Hamtramck, Michigan? <laughs> and first of all, tell us, let, I, let me start you off, okay? Nisha is from Detroit. There are two little cities located within the city boundaries of Detroit. One of them is Hamtramck. Hamtramck has been Polish since about 1880 when the Poles came to work at Dodge, Maine, which was one of the big car factories in Detroit. Why don't you tell us what has happened to Hamtramck? Good Polish Hamtramck. Hamtramck is, so I born and raised in Detroit, but I live right on the border of Hamtramck. It's a city that's about two square miles uh, big. So it's very small. Um, and it's a very tight-knit community. So it started off, German immigrants first came, and then Polish immigrants came, and then uh, uh, Bangladeshi immigrants. So my, my family, my dad first came. Notice you said Bangladesh. Yeah, <laughs> so Bangladeshi immigrants came. It was a few waves. So my dad came in the 80s, um, and he, he settled there, and my family members came. He was one of the first families. Like, my family was one of the first families that came. Um, and then Yemeni American or Yemeni immigrants came, and so it's it's a it's a pretty it's a very diverse community. But there's been shifts of immigration, um, and it's really interesting because where we live, a lot of the Bangladeshi immigrants they like settled in Hamtramck, Detroit. They got the factory jobs. Um, they worked for a few years, and then they moved to the suburbs. And then uh, other immigrants came, and so you you keep seeing these waves. And I feel like Hamtramck isn't unique. There are so many towns in America that are that are just like that. Um, but we do like we do cover th these communities. But I feel like there's so much more. Like there's a cool. lot more potential there. And so I totally relate to your question about like you know making the pitch and to cover these communities uh, because it's constantly shifting. It is, it is an incredible, the New York Times has written a, a couple of stories, the, the New York Times has written a couple of stories about Hamtramck. I didn't think the New York Times knew Hamtramck existed. And it's because it is a microcosm of the change that is happening. I went to, the last time I was in Detroit was 2017. I love driving around. I love Detroit. Detroit's the best news town I've ever seen in my life. Forget Washington. <laughs> Detroit is such a great news town. Um, so, of course, I want to drive around the city because people keep saying Detroit is back. I never believe that. I'm a journalist. I had to go see for myself. Well, downtown Detroit is back. I went to Hamtramck. I, saw, I stopped the car when I saw the Arabic signs as soon as I crossed the line. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. So now, the, you tell me if I'm using the right words, the Arabs, or sh okay, because I'm never sure who's considered Arab. Or, um, the Arabs and the Poles are sharing power, literally sharing power in Hamtramck. And that's a story. The city council right now um, is majority, I think the city council members in Hamtramck are Bangladeshi and Yemeni. Um, there was, I believe, a Polish council member who like left, but it's really representative of the people that live there. Yeah. Um, Even the police chief now is yeah, Yemeni. Uh, Yemeni. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you see the same thing in Dearborn right now. That's Chief's exactly right. Members, the, de like the various departments are made up of the people that immigrated in various waves in those communities. Did no anybody notice last week Joe Biden sent some folks to Dearborn <laughs> to talk to them? <laughs> you wonder why. <laughs> That shows the power of the population now living in Dearborn. Dearborn has literally changed from a segregationist white community to a, you, you tell me. Even from seeing, I think, the mayor of um, Dearborn, his tweets, um, he's been really vocal about you know the war um, and how his community feels about it. Um, and you kind of saw like the power that that community has because officials came and like spoke to Arab Americans in like Southeast Michigan. Um, 
but he he spoke he was like very vocal about you know the history of his parents and how they came here and like how vocal that that community has been with everything and so you kind of you kind of do see that um because these are people like he grew up in dearborn and now he's the mayor of dearborn he's like a, a son of dearborn right and he's right. speaking for the people that are there right so let's go back to your editors that you're trying to sell this story to journalists put facts together right that's the only thing we compute are facts i suggest you look at your demographics and you go to your editors and say look this is where this community was 10 or 20 years ago. This is where we are now. Look at your school system. That's where the change is going to be seen first. Look at the school, what the, the makeup of the school population 10 or 20 years ago, what it looks like today. Talk about you know, specific neighborhoods. You've got to give your editors facts. That's the only thing we compete are facts. And if you lay out, look at the voting numbers, you take those to your editors and say, look, this is a great story. This community is starting to change. Look who's on the city council. Look who's running for the city council. This is a story that we need to cover. And I'm not the only one who needs to cover it. Whoever's covering schools needs to cover it. Who's playing on the sports teams these days, you know? I see young Arab guys now running through my neighborhood because <laughs> they're trying out for the track team for heaven's sake. Um, at McLean High School, you know, which used to be really white. Start there with the facts. This is not about emotion. This is about cold facts because that's what we deal with and that's what we compute. Okay. I think that's such an important point. Again, getting back to what I said earlier, because in a lot of cases, the heart harsh cold reality is those gatekeepers aren't aware of that they're not living and they're not moving in those spheres they they don't in their uh, parent groups and their social groups and whatever they feel very much uh, the same let's come here oh okay yes Hi. my name is Caroline Colvin I'm a DEI reporter for HR Die. Um, I don't even know what you just said. <laughs> I'm sorry. So I cover <clears throat> diversity, equity, and, and inclusion. And to your point about like diversity being a hollow term, I uh, literally interview people talking about like DI consultants who are like talking about inclusion and belonging and employee experience. You have a better chance of going further with that. So I, that really resonated with me. Um, I think my main question is beyond buy-in from the editors, um, how do you get buy-in and staying power? for our readers. So like I like write for like a B2B publication. So I write for people who are like running companies, employers. And um, you know, I started in 2021. So 2021 people were still hot off of like, you know, um, the Black Lives Matter movement rekindling. And they were like, you know, we're gonna make good on our promises from summer 2020. And then, you know, as time has gone on, even the polls have shown people are not putting money into like DEI initiatives anymore. There's so many DEI layoffs. You know, it's not chic anymore, so people don't care. So I think my question for you is, how do I get, um, how do you, like, how do you communicate the importance of longevity for, like, the policies that people propose? Let me answer your question this way. What I have seen, it's, the bu it's small businesses that change. Can you go into a nail shop these days that isn't run by a nice Vietnamese lady? I mean, Vietnamese women have cornered the market on nail shops. I'm sure that's happening in your, it, it, it's happening in McLean, you know, frankly, where many ladies can afford to get their nails done. I'm not one of them. Um, but if you, even if you go into small towns, the Vietnamese, that's like me, right? Some of them are now selling to Korean ladies and Korean, and so for me, the, that's first of all the business world. What is happening to small businesses? You might check with your Chamber of Commerce, 40% of the McLean Chamber of Commerce now is made up of Koreans and Vietnamese. <laughs> that sounds like a story to me. Um, so these small business people are running businesses that really hire people, right? Is, is that a way to do this? You also might want to look at sort of who's, I mean, I am surprised at the number of large, GM is now headed by a woman. That is just startling. I will also mention that 
the AFL-CIA, which is the largest blue-collar union in this country, is now headed by a woman, and she is tough as nails. She comes from an old line union family in Seattle. That shows you how a woman heading the AFL CIO, hello, this is unbelievable. But this is part of the ooh story. So when there are, the other thing, and people don't talk a lot about circulation now, although newspapers are still trying to hold on to the people who actually hold the newspaper because they still, you know, because they're still tied to that advertising model. People don't read papers where they don't see themselves. This is a new audience. And it, you know, the editor doesn't get this. The publisher computes the money very well. Does that help? Oh, yes. Um, I'm Bianca Kinanban. I'm an education reporter at Blue In Kentucky. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, I'm wondering if you've thought of how the birth rate might interact with this, because we are at this moment where we are seeing this increase. And like in my beat, for example, I'm always hearing about the impending doom for colleges because they're going to have like a cliff where there's going to be less students enrolling in higher ed. And so I'm wondering if there's a worry that even though we see this increase, that the birth rate might challenge, I guess, the growth in power for, for these different groups. No. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, did you notice Latinos grew, grew by 11 million people? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, what they're talking about is their traditional student the ordinary white student, yeah, they're gonna, they're not gonna be there. Their students are gonna look like y'all, and that's who they need to go after, and that's what smart places are doing, you know, particularly Latino students. Let's not talk about colleges, let's talk about the U.S. Army. The U.S. Army said 10 years ago, if we don't get Latino kids educated in this country, we will not have a United States Army. Educating Latino students in this country is, is, is a national emergency because this is about our national security. Because, you know, black kids really, when those three young soldiers were killed in Iraq about two weeks ago, I was shocked that all three of them were black because black people simply don't join the Army. The United States Army missed its recruiting goal this week, this year, by 15,000. And you may think, I don't care. Well, you might if the Russians start acting up. I mean, we need young men and women to put on a uniform and go out and protect this country. You know, every time I see somebody in the world, thank you, thank you for picking up a gun and going out and protecting me. Um, but the U.S. Army has understood for the last 10 years that there, there are two major recruiting pools for them. Latinos, you should look at all the stuff that the Army has in Spanish now. And young white men from the West. So that's how important this is. And they under the Census Bureau has done um, population estimates up to 2050. You need to take a look at those. The, the ordinary white birth rate is going down because white people at this point are old people. And old people tend not to have children. <laughs> but Latinos, the birth rate, I'm just, I'm just going to give you a little bit of sociology here. In order to replace ourselves, you have to have a 2.2 birth rate. So you need one child to replace mama, one child to replace daddy, and you know, then some number of children die. The white birth rate is under this. The last time I looked at the white birth rate, it was 1.8. That's the low replacement level. The Latino birth rate, I think, I want to say 2.6. That's where the growth is going to come from. Those are going to be the kids sitting in first grade. Those are going to be the kids sitting in college 20 years from now. Um, the Asian birth rate is, I think, just about at replacement rate. The more educated people are, the less children you have. They, this, the world finally realized if you want to reduce your birth rate, you educate the women. Because the women think there's nothing else for them to do. They will have children, thank you very much. If there is, if they are educated and they have other things to do, they, they will not have as many children. So nothing is happening to the Latino birth rate in this country. Um, it's the white, not Hispanic birth rate that's going there. So these colleges, 
in fact, uh, this is the last thing I'll say. Remember the recent Supreme Court decision about, get, you know, the next minorities are going to be ordinary white kids. And, you know, they might want some of those laws. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take moderator's privilege for the last question and comment from you, Bobby, because I have to ask, in 1972, Metro 7 files suit with the EEOC. In that moment, was this your vision of what you were going to, to help create one day, or were you just trying to get their foot off your neck? What we were trying to do, I'm going to give me a moment. What we were trying to do is to be equal in the newsroom. Um, you know, we saw white colleagues our same age getting assignments that we weren't getting. Um, this is the, you know, this is the civil rights movement. We were journalists. We covered this movement. We were not part of it, but we wanted, frankly, to do our part where we were. We saw what was going on was not right. It's called the arrogance of youth. <laughs> and we sort of, I mean, I think about that now. And I'm, Ben Bradley was the editor, you know, one of the heroic editors of this country. I'm surprised Ben didn't, ha didn't fire all of us. In fact, he talked about that once. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't, to his great credit, he didn't fire us. And we won at the first step, not the second. But Ben realized that he had to do something. And we, it, it, our, I, never, I didn't know this literally until two years ago. Our suit ended up getting 20 to 30 ir um, minority reporters hired at the Washington Post. So that was all our vision. Our vision was to get better assignments for us and to get us equal treatment with our white colleagues. We didn't even think about getting other people hired. I mean, our vision was this big. So that's why I started off by saying to sit here literally 50 years later and to see all of you all, you all have surpassed our dreams. You know, when we were fighting for diversity, sort of every step, and I had lots of friends, all of us that fought this fight. We may sit around and talk about this. Um, but we are so proud of you all, um, that you're here, that you're hardworking. You know, this country cannot, as Thomas Jefferson said, this country cannot do without journalism, um, journalists. And the Washington Post is right. Democracy dies in darkness. We cannot have that. I don't know about you all. Welcome to the fight. But I'm going to give Bobby Bowman a standing ovation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. May the force be with you. <laughs>